Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And we are very glad that you could join us for a special uh, virtual Voices of the Game program today on this Veterans Day 2020. It is our pleasure and privilege to talk to former Major Leaguer Chuck Goggin, a veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, he will talk about his time as a United States Marine in Vietnam. He'll also talk about his rather incredible comeback from injuries, eventual return to minor league baseball, eventual ascent to the major leagues, and also his days playing with some pretty phenomenal ball players, some iconic guys named Roberto Clemente, Hank Aaron, and Carl Yastrzemski, among others. With all that said, we'd like to officially welcome Chuck Goggin to the program on this Veterans Day. Uh, Chuck, we thank you very much for joining us. How have you been? I've been very well, thank you, and it's a pleasure and an honor for you to have me on here. I appreciate it very much. Well, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, here we see a couple of images of Chuck from his playing days. On uh, the far right, there he is wearing those wonderful old blue and white Atlanta Braves uniforms. Uh, really the uniforms associated with Hank Aaron's record-breaking 715th home run. Uh, Chuck was a member of the Atlanta Braves right around that time. Also, early in his career, played for the Pittsburgh Pirates. We see him with uh, the catcher's equipment. That was a position that he learned in the Pirates system. The Pirates wanted him to be a more versatile player, and he did that, and it helped him make the major leagues. Chuck, though, we want to begin the story, though, by going back to your days in the military. Uh, it's 1965. You're in the minor league system of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and that is when the military comes calling. Now, I have read that you were originally classified as 4F, which therefore would have made you ineligible for military service. You had a large scar on your knee, the result of an operation. Uh, you were originally classified as 4F, but then that got changed. You were made 1A, made eligible. Is all of that true? Yes, it is. Uh, in, in, uh, in the middle of the summer of 1965, I was playing in Santa Barbara, California in Class A ball for the Dodgers, and Don Sutton was my roommate, and there were several players on the team, and we were all of military draft age, and the Vietnam War started heating up. Lyndon Johnson started sending more troops over there, and a bunch of us were talking about it, and we were concerned that we would get drafted. So we had a day off on a Monday one time, and we all went down to Los Angeles to join the reserves so that we wouldn't lose any baseball time. And when we got down there, we were going through our physicals and everything and, and five of us all together. And when I got down to my physical, we stripped on down to our shorts and the doctors are looking me over. And I had just, the, the, the winter before I'd had ACL surgery on my knee. And they said, well, you're, you're 4F. There's no way you're ever going to be drafted with, with this injury. Uh, you can join if you want to, but I don't see any reason for you to do it. So the other four guys all joined the reserves, and I sat there and waited for them to get finished, and we went back to Santa Barbara. Finished the season, went home. My home was Pompano Beach, Florida. And about a month after getting home, I got a letter from the draft board, and they had X'd out. 4F and typed in 1A above it and told me to report to uh, Coral Gables on the 9th of February of 1966, which I did, and uh, gone for the next two years. Why do you think they changed it? Were they simply desperate for more manpower, or was this a case of upon further review, we don't think your knee injury is that bad? No, I, th I think it was just they needed manpower. And uh, they were drafting an awful lot of people at the time. And I was sitting down there. I actually got on a bus. There were five buses after we got down there. And the buses were all going up to Fort Benning, Georgia. Everybody was going in the Army. And I had already gotten on the bus. And I was on the second bus. They put us in alphabetically. And uh, I, I'm sitting in the bus. I brought a paperback book to read. And I had a little bag with a couple of extra things in it. And I saw this guy. A marine, a, a marine uniform, a gunnery sergeant. And he went up and started talking to the officer in charge. And he went on the first bus. And a few minutes later, 
he came back out and he came walking back and he gets onto the second bus and he says, is Goggin Charles F in this bus? And I raised my hand and I said, I'm right here. And he says, would you come with me? Bring your stuff. So I picked up my little bag and my book and I got off and <clears throat> he took me into his office and he said, uh, I'm going to make you an offer. He says, I'm going to give you an opportunity. He says, how would you like to be a United States Marine? And I thought I was on the bus to go join the Army. And I said, well, I thought I was getting drafted into the Army. And he said, well, no. He says, we've had one chance just in the month of February to draft. The Marines never drafted. And he says, we have a chance to, uh, to draft some people into the Marine Corps. How would you like to be a Marine? And I said, well, you get, can I? Can I think about that a little bit? And he says, sure, take your time. And he gave about 10 seconds later, he said, ah, forget about it. He says, I'm putting you in the Marine Corps. Do you have all your stuff? I said, yes, sir. The buses left and I stayed. Midnight that night, we took a train and then a later a bus and ended up the next morning. I was in, in Paris Island, South Carolina. How did you feel going from 4F to 1A to essentially being force-fed into the Marines. I mean, were you very upset or were you able to accept this? No, I, I accepted that. I, uh, it, it, it's hard for me to, to tell somebody that doesn't really understand, but I was very, very proud to serve my country, especially in the Marine Corps. Uh, when I look back on it, that was 53, 50, 54 years ago now, uh, I had already played two years in the minor leagues and now I'm gone two years. And when I came back, I had to start over again. It, it desperately cost me uh, as far as a baseball career was concerned. But I will say that, that all this time later, over a half a century later, I, I would not have traded that. I'm, I'm proud of what I did, proud of the people that I served with and, uh, to this day, some of my closest friends are people I served with in Vietnam. We get together every year. Wow. You mentioned, Chuck, that you went to Paris Island for training as a Marine. Uh, I've never gone through it. I've heard it's brutal. How tough was it? I thought I, after about the first three days, I thought I'd died and gone to hell. But then all of a sudden, it's, I started understanding what they were doing. And I said, OK, I see what's happening here. And, you, you let them train you and you go along with it. Was it, it was a culture shock though. Yeah. Was it more physically exhausting or was it a, a huge mental adjustment in terms of the discipline you needed to have? It both. They, they, their theory was they'd have to break you down and then build you back up. Mm. So that's, that's what they did. It is very mentally exhausting. And of course, physically you're working your rear end off about 14 hours a day. And uh, it, it was, I mean, I was a good athlete. The physical part of it was no problem for me. Yeah. So the fact that you were in baseball shape, that helped you? It did. And, and, and when I went in there, I probably didn't have very much body fat, if any. And uh, I think I weighed 165 pounds the day I went into boot camp. And eight weeks later, I weighed 192. Wow. And there was no fat on me. So it's the first time in my life I'd ever had three squares a day. And with all the exercise and the running and everything we're doing, and I, I, I pumped up. I got pretty big for so me. There was a, lot of, a lot of weight training involved. Well, we didn't lift any barbells or anything, but we're doing – about a thousand push-ups a day and, and running miles. We'd run three, four miles before we eat breakfast every morning. And a lot of, you know, we're, we're climbing ropes and, and, and stuff like that. So we were building up upper body strength as well as, as running. Now you're eventually given orders to report to Southeast Asia. And that means reporting for combat. What was your initial reaction when you heard that news? When, when, when you're in boot camp, the, you, you're as well as the physical part of the thing. You're they're also testing you, and we did an awful lot of testing in there. And I, I think that the, the one set of testing that we did had to do with your infantry prowess, 
and a perfect score in that exam was 150. And I think I had 149 out of that. And I figured, well, I'm going to be in the infantry. And if you're in the infantry in the Marine Corps in 1966, there's only one place you're going to go. So was I surprised to get orders to Vietnam? No way. I knew I was going. Yeah. I've read articles about you and you've made a point of saying that you didn't get any special favors in training camp. Nobody knew about you as a baseball player. You were not treated like a celebrity. The answer is no, I wasn't, but probably because I wasn't a celebrity. I mean, if I'd have been Ted Williams or somebody, it might have been it might have been different, but nobody had heard of Chuck Goggin. Yeah. Probably still haven't. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. And I think maybe things will change a little bit with today's program. Now, you eventually make uh, the move over to Southeast Asia. You're assigned a very dangerous job of being a radio operator. A number of years ago, we had another former major leaguer, a guy that you may know, Bill Campbell. He was a Vietnam veteran, a pretty good relief pitcher in the mid 70s. And he was a radio operator. And he talked about having to lug this huge radio with this enormous antenna, which he felt made him a target as he moved you know, through various battlegrounds. Did you feel like that as well? Was that- was that It wasn't a matter of feeling, it was absolutely the truth. Yeah. You had, you had the radio, the radio weighed 35 pounds. You had to carry your own regular pack to start with and then the radio on top of that. And then you had two types of antenna. And when you get out in the field, you'd have to put that little short antenna called a tape antenna, it was about three feet. But if you wanted to get, if you got farther away from where you were trying to contact, you'd have to put the whip antenna on and it was about 12 feet. And the enemy would always look for the radio operators because the radio operators were always next to the commanding officer because mm. they'd want to take out both. So yes, you were definitely a target when you were carrying a radio. Were there instances, Chuck, where you were directly shot at? While, while uh, lugging that antenna and that radio around? Absolutely. Yeah. Lost two lieutenants. Hmm. Were you shot during any of those instances? No, I got blown up later, but I wasn't a radio operator when that happened. Okay. Let's talk about March of 1967. You're part of a band of soldiers, a really special group, legendary unit that's called Ripley's Raiders. Here we see a photograph of you on the right. So you're on the right side, you're shaking hands with a guy who became a very close friend, uh, his name, John Ripley, and he was the head of Ripley's Raiders. So one day, again, March of 67, you and the Raiders, you're traveling with a company called Lima Company they begin to engage in battle with the enemy. Tell us, Chuck, what happened next. Okay, the first small correction, uh, Ripley's Raiders was the Lima Company. It was, okay. All right, now on March, this, on March the 1st of 1967, we went out on a company size operation in the Northern Quang Tri province of Vietnam and where we were, there was no Viet Cong, which most people referred to the enemy as Viet Cong. Where we were, there was no Viet Cong. There was only the North Vietnamese Army regulars. And Lima Company was dispatched on March the 1st to go out to a particular area right up to the DMZ and search for the enemy. There had been some signs from aerial photographs that there might be some enemy involvement up there. So on March the 1st, we went out and late in the afternoon on March the 1st, we ran into the first of them and got into a firefight with them. And that is when we were pinned down by these North Vietnamese troops that were in a trench at the bottom of a hill. And Ripley, and this was our first combat involvement with Captain Ripley as our commanding officer. And I was then the radio operator. Lieutenant Terry Heakin had just gotten to Vietnam two weeks before he was my platoon commander. And we're in a firefight. We're all laying on line, shooting down the hill at the enemy that's in a trench line at the bottom of it. 
And Ripley was getting frustrated by our inability to move forward because we were pinned down. So Ripley got me on the radio and he said, I'm going to fire three mortar rounds over your head. When those mortar rounds go off, I want first platoon to fix bayonets and charge the position. And I hesitated a minute. And I said, you don't say repeat over the radio unless you want another barrage of ammunition. So I said, say again, your last. He said, fix bayonets and prepare to charge. So you could barely hear because of all the shooting that was going on. But the lieutenant, who I said before was brand new, was lying on my left. And he looked at me and he said, what did the captain say? And I said, he told us to fix bayonets and prepare to charge. And he looked at me, he said, are you kidding me? He says, call him back and have him say, repeat that. I said, I already did. He said, he wants us to physically charge the position. So we passed the word and everybody put bayonets on. Ripley fired three mortar rounds over our head. They landed out in front of us. They went, they went off, we all stood up, bayonet charge on the enemy position. Two or three guys with machine guns probably could have wiped all 45 of us out. But I guess they got so scared at a bunch of idiots walking over the hill screaming like a bunch of Indians with bayonets fixed that they turned and ran, didn't fire around at us. We were pretty fortunate that that happened that way. But that's the only bayonet charge that I know of that, that it certainly was the only one that Lima Company did during the 13 months I was there. Was the Ripley, day, excuse me. Yeah. Was Ripley hoping that they were going to react that way? I have no idea. Oh, no. Okay. But the next the next day we we ended up spent spending the night in the jungle there. And the next the next morning we got up and sent patrols out in, in three different directions. And about 20 minutes after we sent the patrols out, the first patrol ran into some enemies, started a firefight, called for help. We saddled up and headed to, headed to uh, give them some support. And there were, when we started the morning, Bruce, there were 220 of us in Lima Company. And that was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And by five o'clock in the afternoon, there were only about 15 of us left that hadn't been killed or wounded. Mm -hmm on that particular day. And we not only won that fight, we won it big. We didn't know it at the time, but we had run into uh, the 324B uh, regiment of, there are about 1500 of the North Vietnamese and there are only 220 of us. Mm. I became a platoon commander at the end of that day. Lieutenant Heakin was killed, a platoon sergeant was, blown away. And when I turned around, I'm the corporal. I'd only been a corporal for four days and I was in charge of the platoon. Yeah. Didn't Ripley make you the commander in the middle of all this because of all the people that, that you lost? Yes. Wow. That's amazing. It really is. You look back at it. I mean, obviously you guys showed tremendous bravery and skill, but do you think back and say, Man, how do we do that? Uh, that's where the training comes in. So you're at 220 or thereabouts at the beginning, and then you're down to 15 that are, are healthy. Um, so not all the others have died, but there have been a number of deaths. And 11, 11 died and 55 seriously wounded. Yeah. So you're down to a, a scant few, and uh, yet you're able to come up with a victory. It's just a remarkable story. Now, let's go back to this photo um, here on a more peaceful day, you and John Ripley. I know you became very good friends with him. Tell him, tell us about him as a leader. What kind of a man was he? John was a, uh, Captain Ripley. I'll refer to him as Captain Ripley here was, he was, a, I think he was four years older than I was. So I, I was 21. He was about 25, might've been 26 years old at the time. And we'd had a couple of captains in Lima Company before he came. He got there right at the first of the year. I got there in the middle of July of 66 and he came, he came right around the first of the year of 67. And he was the type of guy that he demanded that, that we perform uh, when we were doing our job, he didn't lead from the back. He would be right up in the front with us. 
Uh, he was extremely competent in reading maps and calling in artillery, which you had to have when you got into a serious fight like I had just told you about. We never could have survived in that battle without the close air support. We had airplanes coming in, dropping bombs. We had artillery from the plateaus firing and we're using our own mortars. And he was extremely good at bringing the stuff in so that he was bringing it in as close to us as possible so that the actual shrapnel was dead falling on us. We had it, we had it so close. So John was one of those guys that what many of us had talked over the years when we have our reunions. And if he would have come up to me and said, Chuck, get your rifle, get your ammunition. You and I are going to attack Hanoi by ourselves. I would have saddled up and gone with him. Uh, we would have followed him anywhere. Mm -hmm. Had confidence in him. He certainly looks in the photographs uh, sort of like the epitome of a great soldier, physically fit, strong, but much more important than that. He sounds like he was just about as good a military leader as you could have had. Outstanding military leader. He ended up being a full colonel before he retired. Uh, we're all very disappointed. He thought he should have made general. Uh, but uh, he, he, was, he was wounded over there a couple of times as well, had, a, had an outstanding uh, Marine Corps career. He is, in fact, they teach his leadership uh, in the officers candidate school and training. Uh, wow. All future officers of the Marine Corps are taught about John Ripley. Now, as you indicate, he survives the war. He has a very long career. You become a, extremely good friends. And I believe you remained in touch with him right up until his death about 10 years ago. Yes, when I ended up moving to the DC area, I lived in Alexandria, Virginia. He, he was living in Annapolis, Maryland, about 50 miles away. And we got together regularly and have lunch and, and, and things. He came, he came to my son's wedding uh, up there. And, and uh, when, he, when he passed away, they had uh, a uh, military funeral for him at Annapolis. And they had eight pallbearers and of which I was privileged to be asked to be one of them. Hmm. And four of the pallbearers were former three commandants of the Marine Corps and one commandant of the British Marines, because he had also served with the British Marines for a tour of duty over in London. So I, they had a little old Corporal Goggin up there and all of these generals. I, I was sort of out of place. Chuck, I'm curious, uh, how old was John when he passed away? Ooh, let me think about that. 68, probably. Oh, so he was relatively young. Yep. Yeah. He had, he had suffered uh, seriously. He'd had a kidney transplant and he'd, he'd uh, contracted hepatitis from the blood in, in Vietnam and had suffered with it his whole life. So, yeah. In terms of the mental aspect of the war, was he greatly affected by what occurred? Was he? Yeah. I think I would I would characterize John Ripley as a very gung-ho Marine. I think he probably would have rather been leading men in combat than spending time in a military base in the United States. Mm. So do I think it affected him? I think it for the best. He does. He belonged in combat. He was that type of person. Chuck, let's talk about another serious incident, one that could very well have ended up in a loss of life. I believe it's 1967. It involves a landmine and you actually stepped onto it. You're thrown eight to 10 feet in the air. Did you think it was over at that point? No, we were we were in uh, it was April, and we were doing a sweep through the mountains. We were actually on a portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and there was another company that was a blocking company, and we were sweeping through the mountains trying to push the enemy in front of us to push them right into the other to ambush them, and we were in single file on this on this trail in the mountains, and. Uh, I moved off to the side of the trail as much as I could to let some people pass. And when I did that, I must have activated 
the mine and it didn't blow until I moved away. Didn't know that I had activated it when I moved away, the explosion, and it picked me up and I could feel that it where it had hit me. And I realized quickly when I was up in the air, I said, I've just stepped on a mine and I could feel where it had hit me. And I said, it, it, it didn't kill me. But what if I come, when I landed back down, so what if I come down on another one? Mm -hmm. And so I was concerned about that, but no, I, it, 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 I took most of the blast in the legs and a little bit up the back and shoulder. And I could feel that, that I was wounded seriously, but I wasn't going, it wasn't going to kill me. Yeah. The fact that you stepped off of it probably saved your life. No, I, I don't, it, it, it couldn't have been a huge one. It could have been about a hand grenade size. Gotcha. Didn't see it, didn't hear it until it exploded. Uh, but six of us all together ended up getting, getting wounded from that one blast. I was the worst. Yeah. I spent the next three weeks, almost a month in the hospital. You suffered 14 shrapnel wounds. I mean, how painful was that? When it first happened, I barely felt it at all. I guess, you know, you're shock, you're in shock. But we were in a part of the jungle that I thought, okay, we've been walking all day and I was tired. And I thought, good, they'll get a helicopter in here and medevac me out. But then when I looked around, I said, there's no way a helicopter can get through this stuff that we're in here. So I ended up having to walk out mm -hmm. to Highway 9, which was about two and a half, three miles yet. And when I got up, I had holes in me and the corpsman patched me up so that I wasn't bleeding and everything. And somebody took my pack and I walked about three miles and then they had trucks waiting for us and I was fine the whole time. And then I got in the truck. And by the time we got back to our hill, it was about midnight. And I climbed into the truck. I was sitting in the back of the truck. We had, uh, we had a dead guy back there with us who had been killed earlier in a, in a firefight. And I was fine when I got on the truck. I was fine for the ride. I couldn't get off the truck. So when I got off the truck, they had to, they had to carry me off because I stiffened up so bad after that, that, that I, could, I couldn't get up. So I spent the next, the next time at the, uh, first of all, in the Naval Support Activities Hospital in Da Nang, where they operated. I mean, a, a MASH unit took the shrapnel out and then went to, went to Da Nang to NSA Hospital and spent about 10 days there. And then they transferred me out to the USS Repos Hospital ship. I spent a, about 10 days out there. So that, that was my turn, then back to the field. Yeah. So it was a number of hours before you got serious medical attention. It was, this probably happened at four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And it was the next day mm. before I got back to Dong Ha to the MASH unit where they actually uh, cut me open and removed, removed all the shrapnel. Now, you mentioned the MASH unit, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, certainly made famous by the iconic television show in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the show, but... Oh, yeah, uh, I watched every bear, episode, I think. It, it, does it bear any resemblance to what you went through? Of course, that was Korea. This was Vietnam. Yeah, no, it, it was... Uh, I called it a MASH unit. That was Army. We're, we were the Marines and the, and the Navy. It wasn't physically... It wasn't a called a mash unit but it was the it was the uh, the medical facility in our rear area it was not a hospital mm. and uh, so they do the they do the stuff on you to stabilize you and and get you where they can transport you and that's what they did to me well, they don't they didn't sew it up or anything they just took all the shrapnel out and left all the wounds open i've read chuck that you spent a number of weeks on what's called a floating hospital tell us about that well, they had, a, they had a couple of them. The USS Repos was one and the Sanctuary was another one. And it was a hospital facility vessel. I mean, large, a large ship. And it, it was staffed with doctors and nurses and, and, and uh, naval medical personnel. And uh, when you were wounded badly enough that you couldn't go back into the field and you weren't wounded badly enough where you had, they had to ship you home to Bethesda Naval Hospital or something like that, they took care of you on the, on the ship. Uh, by the time, by the time I got to the ship, I was what they called ambulatory, and I could I could move around with crutches and and stuff like that. The first ten days I spent them in bed, 
in the Naval Hospital in Da Nang. Never did get to see Bob Hope though. <laughs> yeah. Could you not have gone home at that at that point? Was that not an option for you? No, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a, a, a go home type of wound. Really? So you went right back to your command as if did. nothing had happened? No. It was, uh, that was, uh, oh gosh, probably May the 10th, somewhere around the 10th to the 15th of May. And, and so I'd spent close to a month uh, in the hospital in various hospital facilities. And then I went back and ended up taking over the first platoon again. And I stayed the platoon commander once more until August the 20th, which was my departure date to come home. I received my orders to, to come home. Now, was that because each soldier had a, a specific amount of time, maybe 13 months, and then they were supposed to come home at that point? Correct. The, the, uh, the tour of duty for a Marine overseas was 13 months. The tour of duty of actually in Vietnam was supposed to be like 12 months and 20 days. And the other 10 days was the going and coming uh, period of time to get you back. So your, your total deployment overseas was going to be right at 13 months. Yeah. Now, for the many heroic things that you did, you received two of the most prestigious awards that any military man can receive. One was the Purple Heart and one was the Bronze Star. Uh, tell us about receiving those awards. I imagine you still have them to this day. What do they mean to you? Oh man, well, I'll tell you, I did, I do, I have another one that, that nobody talks about much, but uh, it's called Across a Gallantry. And, and they, obviously I just described to you how I got the, the Purple Heart. So that goes without saying, I'm, I'm very, very happy to have it and for it have, to have not been so serious that I was not, I was, I would have been unable to play baseball. If it had been a wound that had been so serious that I couldn't have tried to resurrect my career in baseball when I got back, I probably would be talking differently about it now, uh, but it wasn't. And I was able to play baseball again. And uh, I'm proud to have a Purple Heart. Now the others, without going into any details, the only thing I'm gonna say is, is that somebody recognized something that I did on different occasions and decided to write me up for awards. I am very grateful to receive them. What I think about them is that during the most horrendous times, I was able to do my job. And by being able to do my job, because each of these awards was awarded to me for periods when I was actually leading troops in battle and I was able to do so and nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. So basically what it means to me is, is it don't matter how bad it was hitting the fan. When I was asked to do the job, I did the job and the men along with me when I ordered them to do it, did it. So it is a, it is an honor to have them. It should be it, all of my men that I served with should have got them with me. Mm. Well, that's that's a great way to think about it. And um, I think it says a lot about your character as well. So your service finally does come to an end in 1967. And then in February of 1968, you're able to return to the Dodgers, uh, not to play at the major league level. You're still a minor leaguer at that point. You've lost... Uh, you know, a season and a half of development or more at that point. Uh, so you play the season at double A, but then after the season, you go to instructional league and you meet up with a fellow named Tommy Lasorda. Tell us about that. Well, fortunately, I, I, I met Tommy the first day I ever came into spring training. He was a kind of a roving instructor uh, with the Dodgers back in 64 in my, in my first spring training. 
And when I got back, he was he he was managing. I forget where he was managing in '68, but '69 he was going to manage AAA. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, he's going to go to the Instructional League and he's going to manage the Dodger team in the Arizona Instructional League. And so the the Dodgers called me at the end of the 68 season when I played at Albuquerque for Roger Craig and asked me if I wanted to play winter ball in Mexico because a team in Mexico had asked about me. And I told him, I said, I've just been out of the country for the last two years. I said, I, I would rather not. I, I would like to play winter ball, but I don't want to leave the country. So they sent me to the instruction league mm -hmm. and uh, Tommy was, Tommy was running it. And, uh, I had a really, really good year going down there. I, I, I think I was hitting 336, and I was either leading the league in hitting or close. And I was leading the league in stolen bases at the time when I stole one too many mm. and broke my ankle when I slid into second base. And uh, that was the end of my, my uh, winter ball. Uh, they had surgery on me and put me back together again and everything. And I went home from there and showed up at spring training on first day. And I wasn't quite ready to go, but I faked it. Hmm. I've always heard that Lasorda, maybe his greatest strength as a manager, is motivational ability. Was, was that an assessment that was accurate with you? Oh, he was a supreme motivator. And... Uh, I mean, he would he would get in your face when you needed to get in the face. He would get in the umpire's face. He would do whatever he could. He, he wanted to win, and he'd fight you tooth and nail in order to do that. I love playing for him. Yeah. Was he the guy that encouraged you to become a switch hitter? Actually, he didn't encourage me. I I went to him one day in, spring, in uh, winter ball before I broke my ankle, and Walter Alston was the manager of the Dodgers, and – of course, I'm trying to get to the big leagues and I want to play for the Dodgers. And Walter Alston was a total platoon manager. And I was a right-handed hitter. And I'm an infielder. And Wes Parker was at first base and he's a switch hitter. Jimmy Lefevre was at second base and he's a switch hitter. Maury Wills is at shortstop and he's a switch hitter. And Jim Gilliam was at third base and he's a switch hitter. Mm -hmm. So what chance does a right-handed hitter have coming up with all these switch hitters and a platoon manager. So I thought if I'm going to, if I am going to have a chance to play in the big leagues, maybe I ought to learn to switch hit. So I went to Lasorda one day and we were going to play, I think it was the angels. And I said, Tommy, will you mind if I hit left-handed today, I'd like to learn how to switch hit. And he said, go ahead. So I went up to my very first at bat. I'd never hit left-handed in my life. And my very first at bat, I singled up the middle. And when I was running around, I tripped over first base and fell flat on my face. And one of the guys yelled, you can hit left-handed, but you can't run that way. <laughs> and I, I ended up going four for four, all left-handed in my, in my first game. And four for five, the second game. And I said, I think I'm going to stick with this. Yeah. Chuck, I'm curious about your mindset. Uh, there was another player that you may have known, Bobby Jones, as an outfielder. And he was a Vietnam vet. He suffered major hearing loss. Um, he was uh, part of a, a, a regiment that was shelled for like 40 days in a row. So he had major hearing damage in both of his ears, but he was able to come back. And he had a journeyman career as a player and then a very successful career as a manager. But he talked about when he came back as a player, he felt Vietnam had made him a better player because it made him more serious about the game. I'm also curious if maybe after coming back from Vietnam, if problems came up, they may be paled in comparison to the problems that he faced in Vietnam as a soldier. And that new perspective maybe helped him as well. Did any of that happen for you? Did you think you became a better player because of what you went through in Vietnam? I don't know if I became a better player, but I I became a 
more relaxed player on the field because even if I had a bad day, it wasn't going to kill me. And if I had a bad day in Vietnam, it was going to kill me. So I think it probably helped me deal with the stresses of the game better having, having done that. If that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to start to take questions from the audience for Chuck Goggin. Um, as you can see, Chuck, after returning to baseball with the Dodgers, uh, was eventually traded mid-69 to the Pittsburgh Pirates, later played for the Atlanta Braves, Boston Red Sox, and along the way uh, was teammates with some immortal players like Clemente, Aaron, and Yastrzemski. We're going to talk about a lot of that coming up, but we do want to take your questions as well. And we'll do that uh, in our Zoom group chat. So if you have questions for Chuck, uh, just go to the chat box, uh, type in your question, and uh, we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can. As you can tell, it's a fascinating story. Uh, it's a story of perseverance, of character, skill, um, and it's just a, a series of comebacks as well that uh, uh, Chuck Goggin was able to wade his way through in forging a career as a major leaguer. Chuck, I, I mentioned a moment ago, you're with the Dodgers midway through 69. Then in the middle of the season, uh, you're either traded or sold to the Pirates. And almost immediately, they ask you to play a new position. They want you to catch. Tell us about that. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't almost immediately. I put 1970, I came over to the Pirates. We traded for Jim Bunning at the very end of the 69 season. I went to uh, instructional league ball in Bradenton with the Pirates and then went to spring training in 1970 with the big club. And then I, I went to triple A ball and Joe Morgan, the former manager of the Boston Red Sox was the manager in, in uh, what was Columbus, Ohio then, which was in the international league. I was a utility player. I, I only got about a hundred at bats during the year. And I feel I felt like at the time that my career was kind of at a crossroads and uh, I'd come back, I'd missed two years. I'd played a couple of utility years and I didn't get a lot of at bats. So we finished the 1970 season. When I went to spring training in 71, I went right back and I was going to be in the same role uh, with uh, Joe Morgan in, in Columbus, which was then Charleston. We'd moved to Charleston and uh, we were playing uh, a, a game spring training game against our double A team uh, in spring training that year. And I was watching the double A team and they had a pretty good looking team, but they, they, they had an old journeyman catcher and they didn't have very good catching staff. And I, I just looked, I talked to Harding Peterson, who was the farm director at the time. And, and I said, Harding, I said, I, I can't go back to triple A ball and, and be a utility player. I said, my career is gonna be over. I said, from what I was just looking at, you need somebody to be a catcher every day in double A ball. And I said, I will go back to double A ball and be a catcher in order to play every day. And he said, you really wanna do that? And I said, yeah, I will. I said, do, do you want me to do it? And he said, I'd love for you to do it. And I said, well, there, there's only one catch to it. And he said, what's that? And I said, you have to buy me two catcher's mitts because I can't afford them. And he, he shook my hand and said, that's a deal. He bought me two Rawlings catcher's mitts and I just switched dugouts and became the catcher for Waterbury, which was our double A team in the Eastern League. I was leading the league and hitting through the first half. And they sent me to back to Charleston this time, where instead of being a utility player, I played every day. Mm -hmm. I hit 318 in AAA after that. And then the next year I was back in AAA again and was a runner up to be the MVP for the International League in 1972. That's how I ended up finally making it to the big leagues. Yeah. You had always been a versatile player. You had played several infield positions, several outfield positions. Catcher's pretty demanding, but if there was anybody who could make that transition, seems like you were the type of player, the type of athlete that could do it. Well, I appreciate that, but I, when I finally made the big leagues with the Pirates the start of the 73 season, because of what happened to Roberto Clemente in the offseason when he was killed in that plane crash, 
they ended up switching Manny Sanguian to right field. Mm. To, to, Manny was a very good hitter, and they were trying to take, take up Roberto's spot in the lineup. So I had to go to spring training behind Milt May and be the backup catcher in the big leagues. Well, I was okay catcher in the minor leagues, and I was pretty good hitter and could play good. But I didn't want to be, nor do I think I was good enough to be a catcher in the major leagues. And I was disappointed. I was very, very happy to finally make a major league team at the beginning of the year. But I was disappointed that I had to do it as the bullpen catcher. Mm. And after about a month, the Pirates called me and said they were going to bring another catcher in. They were going to send me down uh, to the minor leagues. And I told uh, I told him, no, I said, uh, I said, I'm not going down. I said, I can't do any more in the minor leagues. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, uh, uh, Joe Brown was the, was the general manager. And I said, I'll go down there for two weeks. And I said, if you haven't traded me to a major league team in two weeks, I said, I'm not even going to unpack my car. I'm just going to go home and my career's over. Mm. So I went down to Charleston for two weeks. Within the two week period, he traded me to the Braves. And I was as happy as I could possibly be. Let's go back to 1972. You mentioned Roberto Clemente. You make your major league debut in September of that year. September 30th is the day when Roberto Clemente hits that ringing double against John Matlack. Milestone hit number 3,000. And there he is holding that baseball in his right hand. But it's also the same day, the same game, where you picked up Major League hit number one. And I guess right after the game, they had you pose for this photograph. That must have been a tremendous feeling. It was tremendous. And, and of course, September 30th, I will never forget September 30th because it was the day I got my first hit. But it's also my wife's birthday. <laughs> so I, I, I never can forget that now. Right. But what happened was I was leading off in that game. And... Everybody was there to see Roberto get his 3,000th hit. And I got first time up, I got a base hit to center field off of Matt Black. And uh, I was trying to remember, I've forgotten the name of the umpire now, but I got a base hit to center field and they flashed it on the big scoreboard of it. So that was Chuck Goggins' first major league hit and uh, Doug Harvey. Yeah. And so Doug Harvey called a timeout and he said, he asked for the ball. And he came over and he flipped the ball to me. And he said, I thought you'd probably want to keep this. So, yes, I did. And I've got it. I've got it right here. And so that was my first hit. And as far as I was concerned, if I never got another one, I would have died and been happy because I now, I, although I had been up a couple of times pinch hitting since I'd been called up, uh, I had a walk and I had to fly out, I think. Uh, now I am solidified in the record books as having actually been there. So I ended up getting another hit in my second at bat too, before Roberto got, by the time Roberto got his hit, and I think it was the fifth or sixth inning, we only had two hits and I had them both in that game. You did him against a pretty good pitcher, left-hander John Matlack. He was their number Very good pitcher. Starter behind Seaver and Kuzman, but on a lot of teams, he would have been the ace. He, he was real good. Yes, he was. I'd play, I'd, Played against him in the minor leagues. Okay. Whose idea was it to take the photograph after the game here? You know, I don't know. I, I, our lockers were not that far apart. And all of the reporters were sitting over there talking to him. Nobody was talking to me. And he was sitting there and he had, he had the ball and, and the reporters were talking to him. And I was sitting there and I was just looking at him. I was, minding my own business in, in my own locker. And one of the guys said, Chuck, is that your first hit too? And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, well, come over here and let, let me take a picture of this. So that's, I moved over there and that's where the picture came from. Now, not knowing at the time, that's going to be his last hit. Yeah. What was Roberto like? I know you weren't there a long time and you probably didn't get a chance to know him as well as some of the other veterans on the Pirates, but what was he like? Well, I, no, I certainly wouldn't say we were good friends or anything like that. I was, you know, he was a, a veteran and a star. And uh, I personally liked Roberto. He treated me well, uh, didn't talk to me like he was a big shot and I wasn't. Uh, 
from everything that I know about him, he was doing things off the field that he never sought any notoriety over. He would go visit hospitals and visit people in the hospital and, and stuff. And, and, and so I, I had an awful lot of respect for him, both on the field, obviously, because he had tremendous skills, but off the field as well. And when the season was over, I went to Puerto Rico for winter ball and there were about five pirate players on the San Juan team, including Manny Sanguin and Bob Johnson and Richie Zisk and myself. And I think Jim McGee was there, but, but uh, one day it was either the day before New Year's Eve or right. I think it was the day before Roberto came in the, in the clubhouse and he was talking to us and he was doing this relief work uh, for uh, the Nicaraguan earthquake people. And so he told us what he was doing. And then he sat down and Manny Sanguin's locker was right next to mine at the time. And he sat down talking to Manny and he was trying to talk Manny into going with him to Nicaragua. And, and Manny idolized Roberto. And he said, Roberto, he says, I can't go, uh, go with you. I've signed a contract. We've got games. And he says, I've signed, a, I've signed a contract. And he says, I've got to honor that contract. I can't go with you. And, and we all chipped in some money to help with Roberto's relief efforts. And Manny didn't go. And then we played, I think we had a double header on New Year's Eve. And that night for New Year's Eve, we had a, a New Year's Eve party in, uh, I believe it was Richie Zisk's apartment on, in the Condado. And we were out there just after midnight, we were out on his patio overlooking the ocean and we saw all this commotion uh, going on out over the ocean. We, we didn't know what it was until the next day. And the next day, because we thought Roberto was already gone, but he'd been delayed. Mm. And we didn't find out until the next morning that that was Roberto's plane that had crashed. The mood must have changed radically at that moment. Oh, it was a somber clubhouse. There isn't any question about that. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 me like baseball that. lost a great player and he, humanity lost a good man. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned that he treated you very well. You know, back in the early 70s, veterans often hazed rookies. They gave him a hard time. Uh, sounds like Clemente wasn't that kind of guy. You know, I, I, no, he wasn't. And I'm just trying to, your question made me think back. And I don't remember getting hazed by anybody on any of the teams. So I, I it, it was, maybe it was because I was older by the time I finally got yeah. to the big leagues. I wish I'd have been 19 or 20, but no, I was 27 by the time I got up there. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's talk about some of the other teams you played for. 1973, uh, you're sold to the Atlanta Braves and you become a very important part of a, a bench brigade that was actually nicknamed F Troop. You remember that? Yeah, I, I, I did that. You did? Uh, I had done that in 1968 when I was playing in Albuquerque for Roger Craig. And if, if you remember, it's a, the peop, maybe the people listening aren't old enough to remember, but they used to have a TV show uh, called F Troop. And it was about a cavalry unit back in the old West. And in this cavalry unit, it was all a bunch of people that nobody wanted. They're a bunch of misfits and they put them all into into one organization. So I jokingly one day started talking about it when, when cause I was on the bench for the 68 Albuquerque Dodgers. And with the rest of us, we were trying to form some identity. We wanted to be available to help the team when they needed us, but we needed an identity. I said, they're treating us like F troop. And so we started having a little fun with that. And so when I go to the Braves, of course, we're on, I'm on the bench there too. So I instituted, we made a flag. Dick Dietz was part of that. Sonny Jackson and myself and uh, Paul Casanova. And anybody who was not playing, who was not starting the game was a part of F Troop. Mm. And F Troop was very cognizant of their stats. So we always wanted to do as good as we could because we wanted our stats to be as good as anybody else's. There was only one person that would not be part of F Troop when they weren't playing. Guess who that might have been? When they weren't playing? Yeah, when, when he was not playing, he did not want to be associated as a part of F Troop. He, let me tell you, he wore number 44. Ah, Henry. 
he did it chokingly, but he said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to be a part of that. Yeah. Tell he had fun with it. Teammate of Hank Aaron. Pardon me? Tell us about being a teammate of Hank Aaron. Well, obviously, I'd come from the Pirates where I'm a teammate of a couple of Hall of Famers, and I go to the Braves, and I'm, in my opinion, other than Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron is probably the greatest player that, that ever played. And, of course, it's towards the end of his career, but I know what he's going for. I mean, everybody in the world knows that he's going for Babe Ruth's record. And the, the man had class and he had dignity and he had an awful lot of adverse publicity and mail, uh, death threats against him. And you never would have known that from, from the way he, he put the uniform on and went out in the field. He had some bodyguards with him. Uh, we would go on the road and, and they would have a hotel room for him in our hotel, but he would have, he would stay somewhere else. And, and the, the things that he had to put up with when he was going for that record, uh, there's not a lot of people that could have done that and performed as well as he did. Uh, I have an awful lot of respect for, for what Hank did as, as a great player. I mean, you know, a lot of people didn't realize when, when Hank retired, Ty Cobb had the most hits in baseball, but I believe he was second. And it wasn't just the fact that he hit 715 home runs or 755 he ended up with. This was a great, great baseball player. And, and I was proud to play with him. Very, very proud to have been a teammate. So he didn't talk to any of the other players about the death threats, the concerns that he had. He kept all that quiet. Well, he certainly didn't talk to me. But I, whether he talked to anybody else, I don't know. But it was not something that – it was something that Eddie Matthews discussed with us as a team that, you know, we need to be alert and, and, and everything mm -hmm. because of what's happening with Hank, but Hank, Hank never used it as an excuse or anything like that. Well, you had that very productive 73 season as part of F troop. You come back to the Braves spring training of 74, but it's a bit of a numbers game. You end up getting traded to the Boston Red Sox for a catcher, Vic Carell. So now you have a chance to play with another future hall of famer, Carl Yastrzemski. Well, I did, and I certainly can't say that I, that Carl and I hung out together because I sure wasn't there very long. Uh, what happened to me in, in spring training of 1974 was it was basically the end of my career. Uh, I played another year, but but I, I got hurt in spring training. We were exercising out in right field in the morning, and I ruptured a disc in my back doing a sit-up, mm. and I struggled through – the 1970, I missed all of spring training. I didn't have a single at bat or anything in spring training. I was literally back in my apartment in spring training, flat on my back with my legs up on a couch because I couldn't even stand up. And they traded me when I was in that condition. I can't believe the Red Sox didn't nullify the trade, but I got, I got over there to them and I had to start the season on the disabled list and then go back down to the down to the minor leagues because I'd missed all of spring training and I just couldn't, I was done. I mean, I knew I was done then my back wouldn't work. Mm. And uh, I struggled through that 74 year called back up to the Red Sox at the end of the season. And that was the end of my, my playing career. I just too many injuries and couldn't rehab from another one. Yeah. I've heard that Yaz had this incredible work ethic. Uh, he was certainly the leader of that team. Uh, another interesting thing that happens there, you do at least get a chance to be around Fenway Park a little bit. That must have been fun. Well, my two favorite ballparks anywhere are Wrigley Field and Fenway Park, and I hope they never change those ballparks. That, that's just, uh, uh, you know, I'm walking around out there and Babe Ruth played here, and 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 uh, that, that's that's history in the making. I, you know, you're, you're looking at them now, and other than Wrigley Field and Fenway Park, I think Dodger Stadium is the next oldest ballpark and and so you know to to actually get a chance to play even I was only in two games when I was with the Red Sox at the end of the year but uh, to be able to say that I was a was a, a Red Sox and that I played in Fenway Park yes yeah, big time thrill and you know I had we had Yastrzemski who was outstanding and Carlton Fisk who was just starting his 
his big league career and his Hall of Fame career. And and Louis Tiant was on that team. And and uh, it was it was it, to me it, it was just I'm proud. All I ever wanted to do was be a major league baseball player. And even though I didn't have what we would call a anywhere near a Hall of Fame career, I actually made it there and I got a chance to play in some of the places that I revered when I was growing up. No regrets. Yeah. You could make up a who's who of baseball simply based on your teammates with those three franchises. After your playing days, you become a minor league manager at Nashville Sounds. Uh, here's a great photo of you uh, in a bit of a dispute with an umpire. You were telling me before the show that you wanted to get thrown out, <laughs> and you were. Uh, this is interesting, though. Nashville, first year that they had a minor league team, I think it was 1978, and you got to be the manager. That must have been a thrill. It was a thrill, and, and I obviously liked it so well. I've stayed here. It's been my home since then. And, and But, you know, in that picture that you're showing up there right now, uh, I don't remember the date of that, but it was the middle of the summer. It must have been, it must have been a hundred degrees out, and the humidity was about 98. We had a really good crowd in the stands, but everybody was just beaten down by the heat. I mean, the crowd wasn't doing anything. The team was down, and we were behind by one run. And from the third or fourth inning, I said, "We've got to do something to get the team fired up and get the crowd fired up." And I just was, I was looking for anything. That, so that I could do something. And they finally threw this, threw my runner out at third, and he was out. I mean, they threw him out at third, but I thought it's this closest thing. I'm not going to get another chance. So I went running up, started arguing with the umpire, and I got right in his face. And I'm telling him what a good call he made, that he absolutely got the call right, and that there isn't any way in the world that I'm not going to get thrown out of this game, and I'm going to stand here arguing with you until you throw me out of the game. And, and, uh, and he's looking at me like I'm crazy and he wouldn't throw me out of the game. So finally I took my hat off just a few seconds after this picture here, I took my hat off and he said, if you throw that hat, he said, if that hat hits the ground, you're out of this game. I threw the hat and he threw me out of the game. And by now the crowds are all on their feet and they're all yelling and everything like that. So I get thrown out of the game. I threw all the balls out on the field and pretty much, just doing it to get the team fired up. We came back and won the game three to two, I think it was. So yeah. uh, I, I had a purpose for getting thrown out and it worked. In 2016, the stars brought you back to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. Uh, here's a great photograph of you doffing your cap. And those are your two young granddaughters in the background there. Uh, so it was very nice of the, uh, the Nashville franchise uh, to, to bring you back. You told me earlier as well that you're part of a group trying to get Major League Baseball in Nashville. So uh, this is not only the town that you live in, the town that you've managed, but you're hoping to be part of this group that can uh, bring Nashville a Major League team for the very first time. Uh, an, exciting, um, an exciting chapter for you, and I guess something that's gonna consume your time over the next few years. Well, I hope they don't wait too long. I, you know, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> yes. Well, Chuck, listen, we want to uh, thank you for being with us on the program. Uh, it has been a, a special honor for me, for the Hall of Fame, to have you on as a Vietnam veteran, as uh, someone who served this country, not only served the country, but served it so brilliantly, so courageously, winning the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star, and as you told us earlier, the Cross of Gallantry. Uh, you have much to be proud of, and we certainly salute you on this Veterans Day. Thank you very much, and a salute to all veterans. Yes, we send all of our uh, veterans who are watching, listening today. We, uh, we hope that uh, this is a good day for them. Uh, we hope that things are going well for them uh, in their lives. Um, it's not easy for many veterans, uh, but we do hope that uh, at least some of our veterans watching uh, are doing well. And uh, we do thank Chuck Goggin for being with us over this uh, past hour. Uh, Chuck, we do thank you. As we've said before, uh, you plan to come back to the Hall of Fame. You were here in 2013. When you come back, let us know. We'll take you around. You'll be our special guest. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. That's former Major Leaguer Chuck Goggin joining us for this very special virtual voices of the game on this Veterans Day 2020. We thank Chuck for being with us. We thank all of our veterans. 
We also want to remind any of you out there who are veterans, if you come to the museum here in Cooperstown for the remainder of the month until November 30th, you will receive free admission. And if you do come out during the next month, you will get um, uh, somewhat of a map of the museum and it will highlight not only Hall of Famers, but other significant baseball players who served in the military at wartime. Uh, stories of Hall of Famers like Ted Williams and Jackie Robinson, but also even non-Hall of Famers like Mo Berg as well. So again, for any of our veterans, if you come now, between now and the end of the month, November 30th, you'll receive free admission and uh, we will give you one of those maps that will allow you to learn more about some of your military brethren, baseball players uh, who have served the United States at wartime. Thanks again to Chuck Goggin. Thanks all of you for joining us for this special virtual Voices of the Game. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.